Okay, man, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Now, now come on, now crank this motherfucker up. <laughs> Hello, Internet. Gino, that Pinguino Grieco here again with another episode of Deep Listens. And today, we're stacking up boxes and boxes inside of those boxes and boxes inside of those boxes because we played Patrick's Parabox, the game that's boxes all the way down. And joining me today, the person who picked this game, Pete Busby. Hello, Pete. Hey, hey, what's going on, everybody? I almost instantly regretted my hubris in picking this game. It was fun. It was a distinct challenge for my word brain. A uh, fun fact this week, though. It's actually a very fun one. We don't always get those. So this one is about Texas man Jake Perry. The interesting thing about Jake Perry is that he set the Guinness record for world's oldest cat twice. What? The first one. Yeah, the first one was what named Grandpa Rex Allen. Lived to 34 years old. 34 for a cat. The second one was Cream Puff, who lived to 38, which is the equivalent of about 165 in people, if you can make those sort of comparisons. I don't know if you can, but apparently the secret, one of the secrets he claimed for the longevity was their unique diet. Here it was. Here, uh, this is from a uh, Atlas Obscura article on the guy. Okay. Here's the daily diet. On top of dry commercial cat food, they would get a home-cooked breakfast of eggs, turkey bacon, broccoli, coffee with cream. And every two days, about an eyedropper full of red wine to circulate the artery. <laughs> and at his height, he was taking care of four dozen cats. Imagine making breakfast for four dozen cats. What is this guy's career that he has this amount of large- largesse that he I'm could... I'm glad you asked. Okay. He is a Texas plumber. What? Hmm. Yep. I mean, they eat a lot of beef in te- Texas, so they probably need a lot of plumbing. But that's, but I don't know where he's getting all these funds. That's the most interesting man in the world right there. Yeah. So did he yeah, he's crazy. Did all of these cats live to ridiculous ages or did just the – like was he just going for volume <laughs> thinking that one of these cats would live forever? <laughs> so like statistically, one of them has still. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you asked, you know. According <laughs> to him – this is according to him – a third of his cats lived past 30. What? What? Again, according to him, but his vet said that at least six of the cats he's seen have lived that long. My good. So basically, we could cats. Their natural lifespan is way longer than we thought it was, but we just treat them like we don't treat them well enough. <laughs> Apparently, so the average lifespan for a cat, at least according to this Atlas Obscure article, is twelve years. All so these outdoor like cats dragging the stats down. Well, yeah, that's true too. I mean, cats in the wild die fast. But yeah. he, I mean, he's doing something right. He also has a movie theater for them. What? What? Yeah, he built a cat movie theater in his garage. He shows nature documentaries. And all of his walls are lined with, like, basically pathways so the cats can walk around. That's amazing. And- his whole, he's, got, he's married. He's got kids. I don't know what these kids are getting, but it's not as good as the cats. <laughs> the kids, are the kids cool with this? I, there's no mention. There's a mention like uh, there's a throwaway line in Atlas Obscura, where he's like, he's married and has two kids. None of his neighbors know the kids' names. Great. First <laughs> like, off, that's the only mention of them. Pete, you're my, you're going a little roboty. I don't know if something's going on with the cable. But secondly, I just imagine the Atlas Obscura person showed up to get an interview and like tried to talk to the kids, and he just went, no, 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 don't talk to the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's strictly that's not what you're man. here for. No, 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 no. You talk to Prancy, fa- Prancy Face over here. He's the one you want to talk to. He's turning 35 next year. Oh, man, that's amazing. What a supportive family. You know, what a supportive family. What a g- apparently generous person for cats specifically. I mean, Four dozen, just- too. I would leave him. I would leave him at like four, and he's <laughs> going to get another 44 more. Yeah. I- this just reminds me when I got uh, my lizard, I now have bearded dragon. I was told, so she is five, I was asking how long they live, and I was told, apparently, in recent years, P- 
people have made discoveries about ways to better care for beard, bearded dragons. So they used to be like 10 was like the what we thought was like the top. But now they think it's like 15 or 20 because oh, wow. they now give them better better food to match their their diets and better supplements um, and better like lighting technology to give them uh, what they need. Better lighting energy. technology, like they got ring lights to make sure they're looking good. <laughs> like it's the light is a UV light, so that they get UV rays even though they're indoors. So instead of just like a heat lamp, you also have a UV lamp because they actually need UV light to to synthesize certain things. So like before, you just give them a heat lamp, but no, 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 you need multiple lamps. So now I'm the proud owner of multiple types of lamp. You're welcome. That other voice you heard. Is the mistress of games, M. Paladino. Hello, M. Hello. Uh, this was a game that melted my brain a little bit, but I had fun. My girlfriend was much better at it, so <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I, fine. I, I do wonder, we'll get to this when we talk about the game, but I wonder if this game is some sort of like, you know, you know how people talk about, you know, left brain, right brain, or... Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm a Leo, and therefore I'm in charge, or other horoscopy things. I wonder if this game's a litmus test like that. Yeah, you I know, don't know. You, you put it in front of someone, if they get past like five or ten levels, it says, ah, you're a logical thinker. Ah, you're an introvert. <laughs> I feel like it's like a Mensa test. Like, if you make it through like 15 levels, they just send you a letter automatically. Yeah. Oh no, I've been drafted. <laughs> Into Mensa. Uh, well, before we get to the show, uh, reminder, uh, you can get in touch with the show, deeplistens.libsen.com. We have our comment sections, at deeplistenspod on Twitter, and deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. That's where you can send your emails uh, if you wanted to get in touch with the show. Uh, you can also support the show on patreon.com slash deeplistens. Uh, that would get you access to our Discord. We are... We have seen a, a recent uptick in listening and listeners, so if you're a new listener, a welcome. This okay. is our humble little show. Uh, thank you for, for choosing us out of the ocean of gaming podcasts that you could be listening to. Uh, we're the one that will cover Sonic Chronicles, Cole, and the Dark Brotherhood, so you don't have to. Uh, it's also... hard-hitting journalism, really. I'm waiting for our Pulitzer application. Yeah, I mean, where else will you get coverage of frickin legend of dragoon in 2022 and also sonic chronicles and also elden ring all of those things we, we go high we go low we go sideways we go freeways eh uh good one you just heard that show callback but yeah you uh th- thank you everyone who's who's recently tuned in if you are just listening and you're enjoying the show please on whatever you're listening on, if you could hit the little five star, I assume that five is the most stars. It's usually the most stars. Hit that little thing. Help help people find the show. Tell someone you know. And if you could support, you know, patreoncom slash listens. If we get another ten uh, patrons, we will play Sonic uh, 06 for the X- the Xbox and the PlayStation. Um, is we'll that have- the one where he has a girlfriend? That's the one. Yeah, where he yes. yeah he, he makes out with tongue with a human. <laughs> I thought it was very advantageous. Like, it was amazing that they animated the tongue. But we'll get to see it if 10 more people support the show. And it also gets you access to our Discord where you could talk with the host of the show. You could do all, all sorts of fun stuff as a patron. And also our, our regular call out as well to support the National Network of Abortion Funds. Things in the United States, not so great right now uh, with regards to uh, anything. The, well, Everything. Yeah. That's a good point. The the bodily autonomy of folks. Um, the Supreme Court basically overruled a person's ability to get an abortion uh, on their own volition. Uh, it was already pretty hard in a lot of states, but now it is significantly harder in, in about half the country. So the National Network of Abortion Funds helps folks who are in need of medical care get it via either travel or coordinating with uh, doctors, um, coordinating with places for people to stay when they are in need of uh, medical attention or, or abor- abortion services. So if you're in a position to do so, National Network of Abortion Funds, that's who we've been supporting. We did a community endurance run for it. So if you can, please do. All right. So without further ado, we I mentioned the Discord. 
So I think now it's a pro- only appropriate, it's only right that we get over to the Discord report. The Discord report. Boop, 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 boop. This week on the Discord report, uh, there are updates happening to multiverses uh, after we played it, which seem meme uh, Big Chungus might be coming to it. Uh, Pete, are uh, you online enough to know who, who? Big Chungus is? <laughs> Gina, you read my mind. Who is Big Chungus? Imagine Bugs Bunny. Now, picture Bugs Bunny gaining like 200 pounds. That's is this a Vore chungus. thing? This sounds like <laughs> I, a Vore thing. God, I hope not. I don't think it is. I don't think it's a Vore thing. It it, it It's from like one episode of Looney Tunes where there was a, a heavy set Bugs and the internet loved it. They found a clip of it, and now they call him Big Chungus. Yes. Uh, so that would be fun. When we revisit multiverses, we'll circle back around to that. Uh, also, the queen died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that follows Big Chungus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As is right. Listen, I don't choose the order that these come up. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going down the list. Uh, so that was funny. Yeah, we, uh, (laughs) we had a lot of, a lot of stuff was shared in the Discord in regards to the passing of, of the Queen of, of England. You know, join the Discord if you want to find out which way, uh, the Discord leaned on, on the passing of the Queen and how respectful it was. Take a guess. Uh, no, pay to find out. Don't guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. And ongoing uh, food crimes, mostly from ZP. I yeah. think we were mean to him today. It's fine. You know what? We need to bully him until he stops eating these terrible foods. Mm-hmm. Pete, what do you think would be the the most shameful thing to put in the crust of a pizza? Uh, the most shameful thing? I mean, we've already gone with cheese. We have. It's worse than cheese. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of like what the worst... A hot pocket would be maybe ham. Oh, you're so close. You're so close. Did he go bacon? Just like full meme it? No. Mm. And right, why don't you reveal? Hot dog stuffed crust. Suc- <sighs> succulent hot dog stuffed crust with a free mustard drizzle. Uh, 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 <laughs> <God>. <laughs> he could have went for like nougat or something, and I would have respected it more because it would be chaos. This is like he thinks it's a good idea. Yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, at parties, people have pizza and they have piggies in a blanket. What if they were the same thing? Mm-hmm. He, he's posted a garlic knot crust recently. That yeah. looked good ish. I that like garlic I, that, knots. I like garlic knots. I order garlic knots with my pizzas, but, you know, I feel like that'd be tough to handle. Like, the point of the crust is to be a handle to the pizza. <laughs> It seems as though it is not the crust of the pizza, but rather the crust is around the outside as usual, and then there is an inner ring of garlic knots That's like, pretty good. up against the crust. So you <sighs> could pick them off. I worry I that the more you, you finagle the crust, the more dangerous the pizza becomes, the more volatile. Yes. Like, like molten cheese just a few small millimeters away from your fingers feels like danger. And I, I assume the hot dog is equally dangerous, though. I oh, guess we, probably. yeah, it's I mean, choking hazard, definitely. <laughs> I can't imagine it cooks evenly either. Oh, I don't of know. course not. No, no, can't that can't cook well at all. Have you ever have you ever seen just a, a small hot dog aside while we're on the subject? <laughs> they used to have these hot dog cookers that basically the way it worked is you would put a hot dog in between these two metal prongs and it would it would use the hot dog to create a circuit and just run electricity through the hot dog until it cooked from the inside out i have seen this yes it's crazy why why did anybody think jagged electrified metal spikes was the right way to cook their hot dog so (laughs) how do you get it off of there once it's done i assume you shut off the machine Oh, I guess. Or use rubber gloves or something. <laughs> Ground yourself. Uh, yeah, Nikola Tesla's hot dog cooker. Yeah. Really, really dangerous, but, you know, more efficient than Thomas Edison's. Yeah, so food crimes in the Discord. Tons of it. As always. As always. 
Um, so now it is time once again for my obsession of the week. And this week, my obsession is, uh, folks, I got roped into fantasy football again. Oh, no. Grim. They drag me out, and then uh, I get out, and then they drag me back in. And <sighs> can, you, can you explain to someone who, A, does not watch football, and B, mm-hmm. has never experienced fantasy football, what is the appeal of fantasy football? Okay. Okay. So the appeal of fantasy football. Do you like statistics, M? Do you like? Oh yeah. Do you like building teams? Hmm. Do you like? I mean, I don't know any sports statistics really. So you don't need to know them that much because now there's an entire cottage industry of people who will tell you like what the best players are, and they will break them out into tiers for you. So you you start with a draft. You you've played Magic the Gathering. You know how drafts mm-hmm. work. So right. you you pick from all of the players in the league, you know, first round, second round, third round and et cetera, et cetera, and you try to build a team. Uh my my league has one quarterback. You're allowed to play every week. Two running backs, three wide receivers, one tight end, one defense, one kicker and one flex spot that could be a wide receiver, a running back or a tight end. So You fill each of those spots with players, and then every week when they score points, you score points. And your team scores based on how your your assembled players score. So you are basically just signing on to watch like 20 different players across the league of football play their games. You don't have to watch them. I guess. But you are now paying attention to it. Well, it's resource management. So you've got the players that are on your team. You've got some players on the bench, so you want to know, like, okay, this player is up against a is a running back, and he's up against a very good running defense. Maybe this week I should play this other guy who, in a vacuum, is worse, but this week will be better. Or you could be like, oh, I've drafted this guy who is a backup to a player who is injury prone, so I am going to wait because halfway through the season, this guy will likely break his leg. At which point this backup I have will be suddenly become wildly valuable. So you're trading with other teams so that you can assemble better, you know, a better team. Um, you are paying attention to who's getting horribly mangled in this vicious, vicious sport so that you can pick up their backups and replacements um, to make your team better without giving up players of value. You're, you know, you're just managing statistics, basically. You're trying to build the best lineup possible um, every week. And so that's, you know, it's a resource management game at the end of the day. Tom Brady is basically a warrior. You know, he's he's got high stability. He's very stable. He deals the same amount of damage every week. Whereas, you know, some running backs are like rogues. They deal critical damage sometimes, but sometimes they don't do anything, you know? Okay. I think you should probably just play like Blood Bowl. A blood bowl seems more fun. Well, <laughs> no, no. It, well, you, you know, it's a different thing. Also, you're obviously playing with friends usually, and you're you're trading with your friends, and usually there's money on the line. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to win money. Ah, uh, I see. So it's gambling. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's also gambling, kinda. Could have started with that. Yeah, but I mean. It's just... <laughs> It's just, it's like deck building. It's like a deck builder, you know. Mm-hmm. Except the cards are fo- are real human beings, um, and the game instead of you know drawing a random hand, uh, it's a series of football games. But the fun part, M, is that your player doesn't have to actually be good at football to be good at fantasy football, huh. because you only care about the statistics. You don't care if the team wins, and you don't care if they're any good. So like. Running a bunch of yards as a quarterback is very valuable, even if your team is losing, because uh, you get more points for running than you do for throwing. So, like, there's all sorts of weird stuff like that, where you could be like, oh, this team's garbage. Yeah, but this guy runs a lot, even though he's garbage. You know, the NFL, even the worst teams get, like, 100 yards a game, and that's, like, 100 fantasy points. So who cares if they're bad? It's weird. So if your guy doesn't actually get onto the field that game... You, you just get no don't points. get anything. It's yeah, bad. You get no it's points. very bad. You don't want mm-hmm. that to happen. I see. And it happens sometimes. Sometimes a guy gets onto the field and immediately gets hurt, and then you just get a, a straight zero. You mm-hmm. get a critical fail. You rolled a one. Damn. 
yeah, and then sometimes your guy gets like a touchdown in a weird, unexpected way, and then you get a critical, you rolled a 20, a natural 20, and you win, even though your team was terrible. It's gambling. Mm-hmm. It's random. Mm-hmm. And football is the most random of American sports, so it's even more random than most. Is it? Yeah, by far. Yeah, because it's the ball is egg shaped, and turning the ball over is really valuable or really bad, depending on if you get the ball or don't. So, like a lot of scores, like my team. I'm gonna say one last thing on this, and then I'll be done. I had a kicker who was supposed to. He had many opportunities to kick field goals, and at least two times uh, this week, I have the Buffalo Bills kicker. His team just turned the ball over right before he would have kicked a field goal. And it probably cost me six points altogether, at least, because nice. he would have kicked a field goal, but instead I got no points. Mm-hmm. All right. So without further ado, time to go. To, you know, we've we've been talking about uh, dense statistics and uh, and deck building. Patrick's pair box, nothing like that. <laughs> instead, it's a puzzle game about a little box moving other little boxes. Pete, tell me about it. You picked it. Oh God! All right, so it's a it's a puzzle game where you're a box and you move other little boxes. Now these boxes exist at multiple scales. So you might put boxes inside other boxes. You might leave those boxes and go into larger boxes outside the initial box you started in. You might fold a whole bunch of boxes in upon each other to create the sort of multiple box layers. Really, the whole point is you need to understand at all times what's going on in the mini microcosm worlds in your box, the box you're in, and the larger boxes around your box. So it's it's boxes the whole way down. Yeah, and the goal is to put – there are squares that want boxes on top of them, and then there's a square with eyes that you have to be standing in. And so to finish a level, you have to fill all of the boxes, all the empty kind of box silhouettes with boxes – and then you have to stand in the box with eyes. Um, and if you do that, you win. You complete the level. Um, but as you said, Pete, there is there are many, many boxes, many layers to this. Um, so M, how did you find approaching the early the early levels here? The very first move boxes sort of tutorial, the intro levels. The early levels, very straightforward. You are a box, you push some boxes around. If you played a any kind of platforming game it's kind of like that top down pretty straightforward and then you start having boxes that you can jump into and kind of move through and then the camera like zooms in and you're like oh it's starting to get weird uh and then you have to push boxes through those boxes and then there are boxes that are reflections of the box that you're in there's boxes with little uh, worlds in themselves, uh, it very quickly escalates, uh, I would say. <laughs> yeah, so you eventually get recursive boxes. Like, yeah. the box you're in is a box inside of the box. Inside of the level you're in, you see a box containing the level you're in, and a tiny version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Which, I, I mean, from a game design perspective and, like, graphics perspective, that's gotta be interesting to program. I think it's pretty simple, actually. I think there is, like, a way you can take a camera's, like, what a camera is seeing, and then you will project it onto a smaller area. So it's not terribly difficult. It, so, like, at one level, layer of ne- nesting, I think it's probably pretty fine. I yeah. wonder how many layers of nesting they can do before it becomes a problem. Because you're... You know, you're rendering, so you've got a camera looking at the level, that's what's showing on the screen, and then you've got a tiny version of that projected over the box that is the box containing the level. And then if that box contains another box inside of it that contains itself, eventually you could get very nested here with a lot of things caring about stuff that's moving around on the screen. So even oh, yeah. though even though it's a game that's pretty simple graphically, I bet the simple graphics help a lot. I bet if more things were moving on screen at once, it would be a problem. Uh, what are, I mean, while we're on the subject of programming, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but there are certain levels where you just get characters. So the borders of the box are rendered by pound signs. 
mm-hmm. which are actually called mm-hmm. octothorps. Mm-hmm. The box itself is like a little lowercase b or something, other boxes or other things. Is there a process in the design I shouldn't say process. Is there a step in the design process that corresponds to these text panels? Like, is that some like inside baseball we're getting? So that is kind of a, oh, what's the game called? Hold on a second. It's not ASCII. Yeah. I mean, it, it is, is kind of ASCII. It is ASCII. Uh, I'm thinking of a game that was like really early in the lifespan of video games. Rogue? I want to say Rogue. I I think of the more modern Brogue, which is a roguelike version of Rogue. Uh, War Fortress does this stuff too. Yeah. It was basically a... It was too early in video games' lifespan to actually render graphics. So they were like, we're just going to make it uh, be uh, symbols on this sheet of paper that we're printing out. And then as you put in commands, it prints out another version of that, like, it changes the design. And so you would have your little character moving around in a world of, like, dots and pound signs and all that. I do not know why this game has it, but it's kind of cute. It abstracts it a little bit more. Uh, It's not a technical feature in this one. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh... Hard to describe if you don't, like, see it in action, I think. Yeah, so there are three visual treatments that you can actually have on the game. Did you notice that you can toggle between the visual treatments? I did not. Yeah, so I I think it was, like, X or something, X or Y on the keyboard I was playing on PC. Um, You can actually uh, jump between the ASCII representation. You could do that for any level. You can also do a representation where if the boxes are nested inside of each other, instead of having, like, let's say there's three layers that might be going on with a box inside of a box inside of a box, instead of only seeing the tiny little boxes inside of the big box, there was a representation that would kind of show you all three of them as separate levels, as separate boxes. So uh-huh. you you wouldn't have to kind of keep in your brain at all times what's going on inside of the little boxes. You could actually see all of them spread out. Um, Ooh, that would have been pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I did that once because there was a level that uh, the boxes were constantly moving. Like it was it was a nesting situation where it was the the box was inside of itself. Um and the camera would constantly pan out to the upper layer and it would kind of be on a constant loop. Um the level wasn't that hard, but the camera motion made me nauseous. It made me a little motion sick. So I tried to see if there was any motion sickness setting uh, to help remove that graphical effect. And I, it, there was some Steam thread that other people experienced the same problem. And they told me about this toggle. And I decided uh, to, to beat the level in ASCII. Uh, huh. yeah. That would have been useful. Yeah, it was. It, it's a cool thing that you can do it. You can use those graphical representations on any level. And I think... By having those options, it allows you to sometimes remove some of the visual tricks and focus on what really matters in the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Like, ultimately, there's only so many boxes. There's only so many points where you can push those boxes. Because the the way that moving them around is if you walk into a box, it will slide um, in the direction you're walking, um, you know, one square at a time. And then once you get to a wall, you can't push it any further. If that box has an opening, you will step inside of it if you push it up against a wall and then try to walk into it. But like a box that's in a corner now can no longer be moved. Um, You can't push it up. You can't push it left. So now it's stuck there. So a lot of the puzzles are, you know, maybe you need to enter a box from one side, but there's no obvious way to do it. How am I going to be able to get this box pinned so that I can enter it from the right side? from the correct side, um, using another box to, to kind of hold it in place, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. There are properties of what happens when a box gets pushed out of another box. Uh, speaking of, did either of you try pushing a box out of itself? Yes. And then you get an infinite loop. Yeah. You get pushed into infinity and, uh, the level breaks most of the time. Most of the time. That's what happens. Um, that's an achievement. And I think it's also worth mentioning this game has a undo button that will let you step all the way back. Like, it's an infinite undo. There's no restriction on it. 
Um, so yeah, that was pretty clutch. It's mm-hmm. great. Um, and a rest- uh, restart button that will just move everything back to its uh, its beginning point. So this game is very forgiving of experimentation. It really wants you to be trying different things because some of these puzzles are not straightforward. So how far would you say y'all got um, in terms of the level progression? So it goes intro, then enter, then empty, then eat. So each of these are like groups of levels. Um, and the the name of each of these is kind of a... Uh, it tells you what the mechanic is going to be. So like... Enter tells you about going inside of a smaller box. Empty, I don't remember what Empty's whole mechanic was. I think maybe it was just a box that was empty. Eat is about pushing a box into another box. Uh, Reference, I think, is where you start getting uh, boxes inside of themselves. Swap, uh, I think you're just mostly pushing boxes. Like, you're bouncing between multiple nestings of boxes. Um, Center, I don't remember what that one was all about. Clone? Did you get? Did you get to clone? I did not. Get to clone. No. So I I don't remember the exact numbers. I remember actually starting to sort of struggle more when some of the boxes were smaller maps of the levels. Mm-hmm. So like when I had to keep track of okay, if I enter this, I'm also in the small level. Where am I in the small level? How does that correspond to the big level? That's when things started to get difficult and i think by around like maybe clone or so i just threw up my hands entirely yeah yeah i got through was reference before or after clone uh let me find reference so i see transfer open flip oh god cycle, there's so many player yeah it kept going so you Jeez. didn't even you didn't get to to cycle i guess not Okay, clone, center, swap. Reference is like the fifth level, I think. Fifth or sixth. Um, okay, so I got further than that. Um, but that was the point where I was like, oh, God, help. Something's happening to my brain. Okay. It hurts. Yeah, uh, I remember watching the YouTube videos and having no idea where he was going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> like, he'd walk into a thing, and I'm like, where is he going to pop out? It's basically a horror movie now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I I finished the game. Oh wow! I I got to the end. I didn't beat every single uh, challenge level. I think I did every challenge level through like maybe refer eat or reference, like around there. I think I did most of them. Um, and then I I wanted to just see more mechanics because I was like, how f- how many mechanics are there in this game? <laughs> because it just seemed like every every level would introduce something new. So I the reason or the way I approached most of these levels and why I like this game as a puzzle game is this game does not have red herrings. If something is in the level, it is probably necessary to solve the level, right? There's not like a block that's in the level and it doesn't mean anything. Or uh, if a level is a block with like one immovable block in the middle, that immovable block means something. You need to use it some at some point to solve the puzzle. There's no... Like, if if a level has, like, a weird wall that's jutting out, you probably need to push something into that wall, and that jut is, is so that you can get around behind that block and push it away from the wall after you're done. So I just would always think of, okay, what are the different points of interaction about this puzzle? What are the things that are potentially significant in terms of, like, I could push this block, I could push this block into this block, this wall is a little weirdly shaped... So I probably need to use the unique properties of this wall to advance the puzzle. And once I would, you know, suss out what are the points of interaction, I would then kind of work backwards because I would think like, okay, I, I'm stuck here, but I still haven't used that wall. So clearly I have to be using it somehow. So I'm going to step back, figure out, okay, what are the different ways I can interact with this unique shape here? And then once I find something useful there, it'll unlock the puzzle. And I found that really, really refreshing. It's a puzzle that – it's a game where there's only so many things you can do, right? It's a really limited environmental space, even if it's nesting uh, layers, it levels entitled levels to a certain degree. It's all finite, right? It's all boxes. And the boxes themselves are – can only be so big. They're all actually squares. So it's not like you've got rectangular levels or things that are really um, messing up the parameters. So because it was such a small, finite space – 
and the game does not put meaningless stuff in there to confuse you. I found that if I was given enough time in a puzzle, I could eventually suss it out just by kind of uh, reverse reverse logic. You know, see all the points of interaction and then think, okay, how must this be solved? Because these things have to be involved in the solution. Um, it's a it's an admirable process you described, you know, and I'm I'm sure it works. <laughs> but I just sort of like broke out in a cold sweat, and I was just like, uh, why did I pick this? I didn't have to do this. This <laughs> oh, is the no. choice I made. Oh, I it I, is. I enjoyed it. It was yeah. it was really fun, and, and I liked that it's it's a game that really rewards small bursts. It's one of those good puzzle games where if you're stuck on something. Go to sleep, wake up, you'll have new neural pathways, and you'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I, I like that it's bite-sized. It saves its the, – the game saves every time you enter a level. Um, it saves every time you beat a level. So there's no, like, uh, oh, this puzzle, I'm an hour into this puzzle and invested, and crap, if I stop, I'll be, you know, reset. Every level can be beaten in a few – in, like, a minute or two if you know what you're doing. So it it makes it very easy to leave and come back. P, you were finishing. Oh, yes, sir. I will thought. say I did. I mean, I, I enjoyed the game, the portions that I, I played myself. And I actually enjoyed a lot the portions I watched. Like I found something about myself this, I guess this two weeks, whatever the stretch was we've been playing this game, is that it's very enjoyable to just watch other people solve puzzles, especially when they explain what they're doing. And I can just be like, oh, that's smart. Like I started with, the power box, and then from there I went into this sort of deep dive of watching people solve Sudoku. I don't oh. like Sudoku. I hate doing Sudoku myself, personally. I never would. But something about watching other people solve it, I just find very, very calming. Yeah, I feel Sudoku's a good metaphor for this game. That that I like doing Sudoku's, and I think it's the same sort of uh, the same sort of skill set. Like you have three pieces of information, and so you have to reason backwards from. You know, these three things that are known, what would I have to do to make the whole thing fit, the whole system fit together? Em, are you a Sudoku person? I'm not, like, good at Sudoku. Uh, I have played it before in the past. I But I've watched, like, there are some YouTubers who do, like, really intense versions of Sudoku. Uh, there was one guy I was watching a while back who just, like, would solve the weirdest Sudoku puzzles, like with special rules and all sorts of uh, conditions. Ah, the Uh, devil's Sudoku. Pretty much. I wish I could remember his name. Let me me look him up. Sudoku Man on YouTube. (laughs) Oh, no, not Sudoku Man. (laughs) What a B-rate superhero that would be. It just confuses the... the No, his his name literally is Sudoku Guy. (laughs) That's pretty good. Uh, Yeah. I think that's the guy, but there are other people who also do that. What a um, lame Halloween costume. <laughs> that, it would be pretty easy. You just got to wear like, looks like he's wearing a parka in this one, and then he's got his big Sudoku board. So think <laughs> about it. Halloween is coming up. Oh, that's good. <laughs> M, you never got to, so at a certain point, this game stops being about just moving blocks and spaces and starts being more of a, a pr- almost like a programming crash course in a certain oh, God. way. Oh, so God, that say. must be why it confused me so much. <laughs> so, like, a bunch of the ideas here are, in this game, are very key programming concepts. So, like, you eventually, you get clone, which cloning things is, you do that quite a lot. Copying an object. Transfer. That one I don't remember being especially helpful to know some amount of, like, coding logic. The one that really jumped out to me was when we got to cycle. Um, so cycle, you created loops. Uh, uh-huh. So you'd, you'd have a level like kind of facing itself, and you could push a block into a tiny version of that level, and it would come out the other side. And so you'd cr- end up creating this loop where maybe you have a line of blocks, um, and you're pushing from one end, and it's causing the block to come back in on the other side. Um, and so you were kind of using this infinite loop of pushing a block through a level and in through the other level to basically just move the blocks around. So if there was like one block you needed, you had to push on the loop enough times to get that block into the spot you wanted, and then you could move it. So if you understand, oh, this is just a loop, there's actually no consequences to me. Like, all I need to do is set up the loop so that eventually 
when I iterate enough times, the blocks are in the right position. That was that was like the puzzle of the loops. But I've worked with a lot of a lot of loops, so mm-hmm. thinking, okay, it's going to iterate a bunch of times, but all I really need to do is get this one condition this one time. That's the sort of thing that you do a lot in coding um, to try and solve logic puzzles, sort of stuff. Like I, I've had coding. Like one of my job interviews had a coding problem that basically was, okay, figure out how to do this with a loop. And it was very similar to how, what Patrick's Parabox was asking you for. Um, player got really interesting because you became the box. Whoa. Yeah, you were the box. You yeah, could, very oops, meta. You could absorb things into yourself. That one was, that one actually was pretty easy. Whoa. Because, yeah, yeah, I'm watching a clip. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, once you're the box, uh, some of the rules of like, well, a box that's in a corner, you can never really uh, move again. Well, if you can absorb it into yourself and then push it out of yourself, you can free a box anywhere. So those ones weren't too bad. Um, wall was pretty weird. You were the wall. Uh, um, yeah, okay. So you had to like, you had to find ways to get boxes to push into you, which mm. was weird. And then it got really weird. So, like, also stepping into a box that is inside of itself, uh, recursion is a very big concept in programming as well, Um, a function that calls itself. Mm -hmm. So it's another kind of, Pete, if you've not heard, it's it's another way of kind of creating a loop. I mean, I know what recursion is. I just, I didn't realize it was involved in programming. Yeah. Very involved in cognition, mm -hmm. too. So recursion, this game has a lot of recursion in it. It's a lot of, here's a reference of this object, and you can step out of it. You're, you know, surrounded by this object on all sides, so you're in a recursive loop, basically. Like, if you push this object into itself, you're creating another recursive instance. Um, So having those concepts in my head definitely helped, for sure. Uh, And then towards the end, you get, like... I I found the stuff at the end to be... I stopped understanding the... Uh, puzzles on a mechanical level so much as just a reverse i was purely reverse engineering um for like the last few levels like infinite exit did you see pete you saw that one and what do you think infinite exit is infinite exit sounds like it exits infinitely you push a block out and then it it keeps coming out so basically it's a puzzle they were puzzles where remember when if you push a block out of itself it you go into the infinite space right the the oh, no. solution to the puzzle was in the infinite space so you wanted to do that uh, you wanted to make things go infinite that makes sense um sort of so that was weird infinite enter was another one where like you would go into the infinite space and there'd be stuff in there that you want but you could also eventually get to multi infinite which is the last level where you have stacks of infinites. So like you have infinite one, infinite two, infinite three, and you would make things go infinite multiple times. Um, and each, each layer of infinity would push even further out, which oh, was God. absurd, which, yeah, huh. you, you needed to know a whole, you needed to understand how that infinite stuff worked. Um, it got really weird and esoteric at the end. Yeah. I, I bet. feel like, like too, like, I don't, I'm not a, psychologist or a cognitive theorist really but i feel like the i'm gonna make big pronouncements about the brain anyway i feel like the human brain doesn't do well operating at multiple different scales like we're so used to dealing with the human scale that like if we suddenly had to jump from the human to the cosmic back down to the human and then down to like the micro like germs and things like that at multiple different ranges all day. Like imagine trying to pick up a glass if you also had to consider the microscopic implications of the glass's surface in addition to like not dropping it on the floor. Like I just don't think our brains are designed to handle those leaps between scales because we never do it. Yeah. This seems like a game that is, uh, it very much needs to train you in that way of thinking with the early levels in order for you to be able to do it at all later on. Because if it just dropped you right into, like, here's the infinite exit level, uh, we would be like, what in the fuck is happening? Yeah, it really uh, helps. Infinite exit, it really helps to have accidentally gone infinite earlier. Yeah. To have been curious and gone, what if I push this block out of itself? Oh, God. Oh, no. Yeah. Achievement uh, unlocked. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually noticed you got that achievement early on. 
like before I even started playing the game. So I was like, oh, we're going to do some weird infinite loop shit in this game. And I underestimated just how much of that we would be doing. I mean, you can create infinite loops and you can also go into the infinite zone. And these are different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'm trying to see. There were a bunch of achievements in Patrick's Power Box that are just entirely about creating weird logical situations. Um, So, yeah, uh, let me see. So solid become a wall. That was a good one. Uh, push mm-hmm. against yourself. Oh, there was one level where a box was next to a box of itself, um, but flipped. And so yeah, like, you, could, uh, you could walk up to the edge and you would see yourself on the other side. <laughs> I feel so, like just how torturous like language gets goes to my point about scales and things. Like just <laughs> the very phrase, a box was against itself, mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense in <laughs> human language. Yeah, there's a there's a le- uh, another achievement called Oh Dear, where you enter yourself. A tiny version of you is inside of the level, and you are it's you know your character is open, so you can walk inside of yourself. I, I didn't care the way I didn't care for the way Gino said enter yourself there. <laughs> yep, that's I what it that says. Unpleasant. That's like what that. the achievement says. Yeah, there's uh, infinity, which causes a paradox. There's also epsilon. What does uh, that do? So that is when you push. So you, there are some boxes. Reference was a mechanic where you would have a box that was a representation of the level you're in, but was not itself the lev- level you were in. So it would like warp you to somewhere in the level you were in. Oh, what the fuck? And if you push the level you're in into a reference of that level, and then you try to go in after it, it kicks you to the epsilon space. But uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Oh God, I'm yeah. watching. I'm watching someone on YouTube. He's got a. It's two versions of him. Inside one of him is a block, and yeah. inside the other him is the space the block needs to get to. And when you're moving yourself, you're also moving your reflection of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's crazy. You can't yeah, even describe I, these situations. Yeah, like there's a recursion achievement, there's a cycle achievement. So yeah, a lot of like coding stuff going on here, a lot of logic puzzles. I would say like it's one of the – I didn't find it to be that bad. I found this better than Baba is You, for example, to understand for me. Just because there's – if Baba is You, you could do a lot more stuff. Yeah. Um, It was a lot more abstract. I think the uh, problem with Baba is You is the language component too. Yeah. Having it just be blocks in a space is much easier to comprehend than, like, you know, making word puzzles. Yeah, Baba is carrot. Yeah. Baba is solid. Yep. And then Wall what? is Baba. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was a lot tougher for me than Patrick's Parabox. But it is cool, like, when you beat the game, the game pulls out. And it just keeps pulling out and pulling out and pulling out, showing you that every box that you, every level you've oh, gone God. through is nested inside of another level, right? Because at the end of the level, you're just hopping into the next level. So it just keeps pulling out to show you like, oh, yeah, you, it's been boxes the whole time. Boxes all the way down. And then you get access to a little gallery where it, uh, there's a section where they'll tell you a little bit about the game's development. Like it was not originally designed as a, a box puzzle game. It was originally going to be like a stealth game. Huh. What? Where, Interesting. It was a stealth puzzler where, like, you know, your box had to get by certain things without being detected. And, you know, there'd be other rooms that your box could interact with. And then I guess the developer, uh, Patrick, thought, you know, it's actually more interesting if it's just about the boxes and the rooms. Because <laughs> I think at one point he made a box that was one of the levels and he did that. And then it was like, oh, boxes inside of boxes inside of boxes. That's a game. He's like, I really like this stealth, but I'd like a more character development for yeah. these boxes. Yeah. This game it's, definitely does have a Thomas was alone sort of aesthetic to it. Yeah, it does. A little less whimsy, but mm. I've yeah. described games as game developer games before. Uh, this is one hundred percent a game developer's game. 
hundred percent yes for sure and like the in the gallery where they tell you you know here's some early mock-ups of the game here's a uh, here's my notes as i was writing it out here's you know a visual representation of the nesting of the level um at one point they have like you know here's intermediate art as we were starting to refine things and all of the puzzles in that section of the world uh are done in like early in development versions of the art which mm -hmm. is cool um there's also a visualizer that you unlock when you when you beat the game where it's just the box floating around in space with all of the levels kind of floating around you which is kind of fun and then there's a, another room full of even more difficult challenges which uh -huh. i will never do did you try any of them I did not try any of the – I tried one of the, like, uh, challenge puzzles where it used the old art style, mm -hmm. but I did not try anything in the big, like, gallery of challenges. Um, did y'all either – did either of you use the level selector? There's a level selector? There is. Yeah, I did. I didn't see it. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Yeah, God, there was an achievement for using the level game. selector. How do you uh, – oh, no, I did do this. You, like, move over to, like, an, a little arrow on the edge. Yeah. And then you can go up and down because all the levels are inside of each other. Exactly. Yeah. I did notice that. I was like, huh, that's neat. I didn't want to go up because I was like, well, I've completed everything up. Can I go down? You cannot go down. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And, like, the further in you get into the later levels, like, it seems 30% of people have beaten this game. That sounds and, like a lot, actually. Yeah. Like, with it, all the challenge levels? Uh, just got to the the last level, not, okay. not beating all the challenge levels. Beating all the challenge levels, that's gotta be very, very small. Minuscule. Yeah, honestly, it still sounds like a lot. But yeah, it, it, this game's good. I, I enjoyed it. Um, it's definitely, like you said, it it's not for everyone necessarily, um, but there is something kind of soothing about it, and I think it it definitely changes the way you look at puzzles. It it did something for me. It tickled a little part of my brain that I didn't know needed tickling. <laughs> uh, any closing thoughts on Patrick's pair box? No, uh, I mean, as as much as I failed <laughs> in a lot, a lot of the levels, I did enjoy the amount it made my brain sweat. Yes, uh, I was playing this game the other day and my girlfriend noticed I was playing it and was like watching me play. And then they were like, Oh, you just got to do this, this and this. And then I was like, oh, okay. And so I did that. And then that's how I beat like a good portion of the levels in later levels, even though they hadn't seen like the earlier steps. So clearly this is like a litmus test uh, <laughs> for what appeals to you as a person, I think. Uh, and I am ill-suited for it. But <laughs> other people, like my girlfriend, are probably pretty good at it. So try it out. See what you think. Yeah, I would love to know if there's some sort of weird personality test that this game lines up with. Like, I want to know, am I am I a empathic introvert? And that's why this game's blocks appeal to me. But if I was an extroverted Leo, I would be anti this game. There's, there's got to be something. There's something there. G get on it, BuzzFeed list people. All right. So with that, we will close on Patrick's. We will close the lid on Patrick's Parabox. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ha ha. And with that, it is once again M's turn to pick. Uh, M, are you going to do a bad again? I don't know. We've. We've done some bad things to ourselves uh, in recent weeks. I'm going to pick a game that I have heard good things about that could be totally ridiculous. For next week, we are going to play Sir Whoopass TM Immortal Death. Sir Whoopass? Yes. Okay. Spelled uh, as you expect. Whoop ass. One word. Trademark. Um, Afraid oh, to Google no. <laughs> I'll read the uh, Steam description so you get a sense of what you're getting into. Meet Sir Whoopass, the hero from the small indie studio Atomic Elbow, 
who, due to a series of hilarious and poor life choices, manages to bring chaos and disarray to a utopian world. He must find the legendary villain being artifact, TM, to vanquish the immortal and stop him. Oh, no. Very positive reviews. You know what this this whole description reminds me of? Did what? you ever did you ever see the the video game with Will Arnett, Matt Hazard? No. <laughs> Why would they put Will Arnett in the video game? Matt so, Hazard, Bloodbath and Beyond. Yeah, it was a parody comedy action game. Where it was supposed to be like, oh, so you're going to like, I, I'm going to kill bad guys and chew bubble gum and I'm all out of bubble gum. What kind of loser would say that? And it's That's just a like line, a picture, like a, a corpse of Duke Nukem or something. Or like, you know, one level he's fighting a boss and it's a JRPG villain and, you you know, his hair's really big and he's got a big sword and you kill him. And it's like, oh, no, a second health bar because I understand the rules of video games. Uh-huh. Have this you ever seems have you like ever, that? Could have you be. ever seen the movie that line comes from? Which movie? Is that not from Duke Nukem? Did Duke no. Nukem steal it from someplace Duke, else? Duke Nukem stole it from a movie called They Live. Uh, uh, starring Ra let me get the name right. Starring Rowdy Roddy Piper. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like the that movie. You had to look- Look up the name Rowdy Roddy Piper. <laughs> I, 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 I knew it, but I had to like think of it in my head. It was like there's too many words. Uh, the movie generally very silly, but excellent metaphor for capitalism. Hmm. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I guess next we're playing Sir Whoopass trademark. The uh, rest of colon, that. immortal, immortal death. death. Immortal death. Excellent. Uh, I'll find out what systems this is available on. Hopefully, it's out on a console as well as Steam. But we shall find out. All right, so thank you, Pete. Yeah, like I said, I was pumped for a challenge this time, even if I uh, generally failed to meet it. Thank you, M. Thank you, uh, Brain Melty. No more puzzle games for a while. That's fair. And uh, thank you, listeners. Reminder, you, you can get in touch with the show at DeepListensPod on Twitter, DeepListens.Libson.com. We have our comment sections and DeepListensPodcast at gmail.com. That is our email address where you can get, where you can get in touch with the show. You can also support the show on patreon.com slash deep listens. And also, please, if you're in a position to do so, help the National Network of Abortion Funds. You can find that pretty easily on google.com. So, till next time, peace. Peace.